So, uh, however, we have uh, stakeholders across all levels complain of our health students and graduates uh, for being an unsafe to practice, and they blame it on their poor grasp of English. So what's the problem here? If English is the, uh, the real issue here, can we address it by increasing uh, the English language requirements? And we're seeing changes uh, in that direction. So uh, for nursing and social work, uh, they have increased the IELTS entry requirements uh, from 6.5 to overall 7, and they require 7 across all four modules, which are speaking, listening, reading, and writing. But um, the complaints do persist. So is it uh, just a matter of still not having IELTS high enough? Uh, how about we just go to the extreme? So IELTS has uh, zero to nine, why don't we just go to IELTS nine, let's say for speaking. So we can see here, this is a rubric for IELTS speaking. Uh, they want the test taker or our prospective health students to have good pronunciation, to have a large vocabulary, to be able to speak fluently and coherently, and uh, to use complex grammatical structures and to be able to use them accurately. So, um, how about I just give you an artificial, uh, but also not so far-fetched example here. Uh, and this is uh, a, pay, uh, a health professional delivering bad news to a patient. I would like you to uh, have a think about whether this is effective clinical communication. So I'm just gonna read it out. Uh, are you Mr. Bill Smith? Okay, good, good. I just got your test results back, which indicate that you have egregious renal failure with severe peripheral vascular disease, especially to your lower limb. I've discussed this with the surgeon about your gangrenous toes, who kindly advised me of the fact that they need to be amputated ASAP, uh, because otherwise you are prone to develop sepsis and die. I'm confident you appreciate the urgency of this matter, so there's really no need for any further discussion. Please sign the consent form that I'm about to email you so that we can organize a time for the operation. Have a good rest of the day. So, so what do we think? Is it effective for new communication? No? I mean, I would like to think my, you know, it's rather, I guess, you know, I use complex vocabulary. That's what's required in IELTS 9. Uh, there was sophisticated sentence structure, which, who, uh, and I like to think my pronunciation was not so bad, and I did speak quite fluently, I hope. So what's missing here in terms of effective clinical communication? Anyone? <laughs> everything, everything, everything is just wrong. Yeah. It's, it's a bit like a monologue. There's no interaction. There's no rapport building. It's just like, a, you know, I know you're going to be amputated. So let's just get down to business. So, so, so it just, it, you know, like, like um, sorry, I didn't get your name. Uh, uh, like, uh, like it was said, it's just wrong on so many different levels. Um, and this is essentially what I was just assessing in terms of speaking. Um, and this is what I problematize in my research. And uh, what I see the issue here is essentially we're missing out on the fifth skill. So we have reading, listening, speaking, and writing, but the fifth skill is the ability to interact, what applied linguists are starting to call interactional competence. So in my work, I try to develop a framework for us to understand interactional competence uh, in order to better teach it and assess it. What I did first is to elicit everyday members' criteria of effective interaction. And often in the clinical context, we say, oh, we want to see the ability to build rapport. We want to see a person demonstrate professionalism. Oh, we want to see evidence of attentive listening or patient-centered care. However, the problem uh, of just describing inter successful interaction based on that is we often, so this, is, this relates to our uh, uh, Dr. Jane uh, French's uh, earlier slide about culture. These are the, you know, in a way, verbalizable, uh, in a way, like a descriptions of something we actually take for granted. But in order to really understand how these things operate, how we actually build rapport using linguistic devices, using our language, our nonverbal language, our multimodal resources like body language, we need to go a bit deeper and use linguistic analysis to unpack these criteria of effective interaction. So what I did then was to use discourse analysis on actual performance or uh, 
performance data or discourse, uh, more specifically uh, conversation analysis and membership characterization analysis to establish a four dimensional social world that looks at, um, a bit hard to see it here, uh, but basically to look at um, interaction from uh, the, the sequential aspect. So how we develop interaction turn by turn is not a monologue. And also to look at the social cultural categorical aspects of the social world that we are built in interaction, how we talk our identity into existence, how we establish social roles. How do we know that we're talking like a doctor or a nurse and how do we adjust our language depending on the social role our interlocutor, the person we're talking to assume the language has to be different depending on whether you're talking to a patient or a patient's family member or a colleague. So that's the uh, spatial side of interaction. And then uh, I theorize uh, these criteria from everyday members and propose a three-dimensional uh, uh, model in between. So they interact with each other. They are the emotional aspect of interaction, the moral aspect, the logical aspect. So in clinical communication, we can understand that as uh, the emotional aspect, for example, is how we build rapport or uh, with a patient, how we develop a therapeutic relationship with the patient, or when a patient appears irritable or frustrated, how we de-escalate. The logical aspect, how we, for example, demonstrate clinical reasoning, how we uh, walk patients through a head-to-toe assessment, is there logic to it? Uh, the moral aspect, uh, for example, if a patient challenges uh, a doctor's medical uh, expertise, how does the doctor address that? And uh, all these five dimensions work together to help us infer a person's interactional competence. Uh, and now we're going to move on to the assessment side of this. So what I did then was to administer an interactional competence test I developed to 105 test takers. Um, they're here. And then I had two examiners, raters rate their performances. Uh, the test has nine role play tasks. Uh, these are the items. And uh, there were five interactional competence criteria in the uh, rating scale I developed. And each of the category has five steps. Uh, so this is the results from manifested rush measurements uh, that corrected for rater uh, uh, variation and item difficulty. The results show that uh, it is possible and actually uh, more than possible to assess all these complex social cultural dimensions of interaction. And we, uh, and I've managed, and uh, it shows very high reliability indexes. So it's possible to measure all these dimensions of interaction. And perhaps what's most interesting here is that uh, I uh, correlated test takers uh, scores on this interactional competence test with a separate measure of their proficiency, which is what IELTS claims to measure. And the correlation is rather weak, it's only 0.4. So what that means is only 16% of the variance in a person's interactional competence can be accounted for by their proficiency. So if we only use a language test like IELTS to infer a person's, for example, clinical interactional competence, we are only accounting for like 16% of it. So we're essentially missing out on the majority of what we consider to be effective uh, clinical interaction. Uh, and just very quickly, in terms of uh, raising awareness in the field, uh, uh, I, uh, it's really encouraging to see that interactional competence getting, getting a lot of momentum in the field of uh, applied linguistics. Uh, my PhD uh, on this topic uh, was awarded uh, the dissertation award uh, by American Association for Applied Linguistics. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Applied Linguistics also uh, invited me to write an entry on assessing interactional competence. So it's definitely gaining momentum. Uh, if you're, uh, it's also good to see this wider recognition in the field. Uh, my thesis will be published uh, as a monograph by Peter Land later this year. Uh, if you're interested in looking at some of the journal articles I've published in the field, you're welcome to check out my uh, research gate or just shoot me an email. Uh, as to uh, translating research uh, to teaching and uh, wider impact in the community. I try to incorporate the teaching of interactional competence uh, in my everyday interaction with health students at Monash. I also uh, incorporate that dimension in the clinical supervisor training because it's not just students that need to develop better interactional skills. It's also the clinical supervisors who supervise them. Uh, I also deliver uh, workshops and uh, 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 talks uh, to uh, universities and organizations both in Australia and uh, overseas. 
so but I definitely want to see how uh, this focus on interactional competence can be better uh, in a way translated to real world uh, change uh, in how we communicate in the healthcare settings. Uh, so just some final thoughts on how applied linguists can contribute to better clinical communication. Um, as linguists, we can try to work together with clinicians to develop clinical interactional competence for patients and for uh, health professionals to bridge the gap between general proficiency language tests and real world discipline specific uh, clinical communication. Uh, we can conduct this course analysis to understand how interaction unfolds, uh, looking at uh, sequency, affect, logic, morality, and categorization. And finally, uh, for assessment-oriented uh, linguists, we can develop psychometrically robust clinical communication assessment instruments, especially when uh, human examiners are involved. And more often, um, uh, when there's human uh, uh, examiners, there's always a bias involved, and this bias uh, can be the greatest threat to validity, and it's often disproportionately felt by uh, culturally and linguistically diverse students and patients. Okay, so that's the, and some references. Thank you.